volunteering at an organismal lab, we undergrads need to be good stewards. Our creatures should be healthy and comfortable enough to be consistently worked with. But we don't have anthills at the ready in McGill University, so where do we keep them? This is the McGill Phytotron, which we share with many of the other labs. Some of the temperature chambers here are dedicated to our ants and experiments. After feeding them in the workroom, everything needs to be properly cleaned, making sure that no live ants are left behind. It would be really bad if a plant lab that worked here next got infested by one of our colonies. So it turns out that ants don't need mounds of soil and tunnels to maintain themselves. Okay, yeah. So the test tubes here are function both as their drinking spot and where they make their nest. Uh, this red, uh, since the ants can't see the red wavelength, this is as good as them being in darkness. So they feel as though they're underground. We put in cotton so that they can drink from the water that seeps through the cotton, but they don't get drowned. So that's why we have the separation there. Uh, in one of these tubes is the queen, most likely. Uh oh, they're, they're coming up my hand. Um, and, uh, and they lay their eggs there. If, if you look through the bottom, you can probably see a lot of eggs here that the ants cover. So yeah. Here, there doesn't seem to be any messes. So sometimes there's mold and I have to change the tube, which we have footage of. This is a tube that should have been changed and the tragedy that results. If you look in the lower left corner there, that's the dead queen who died of poisoning and was dismembered posthumously as per their burial practice. This whole colony is going to decline now. These guys really need to be transferred soon. You can see that they're, all, they're climbing all up along the wall here. So I need to feed them very quickly. So just to make sure there's no emergencies here that I have Wait, to take care of. Ethan, what kind of food do they need? This is uh, just worms. Oh, it's sort of like crumbly, sandy. Mm. I'm just going to add it to them so they're mean, they eat the worms and this will also supplement them so that has honey and fats and vitamins in it. Don't. Want me to put it in? Sure. <laughs> I just pop the crickets in? Yeah, anywhere is fine. Now, this could be fun and all, but what do we get in return for all this caretaking? I'm doing He's going to attack. <gasps> if you want a system to understand how social complexity really interacts with your genes, then ants are your model. Oh, it's carrying it off. Like ants originated about 150 to 200 million years ago. The lineage that led to the, to the Indian jumping ant represents kind of how those early societies look like. They're very small societies. The individual retains a lot of their rights and traits, whereas, you know, maybe some of the more advanced societies, um, the individual loses a bit more of its, uh, you know, autonomy and starts functioning more as like, you know, an integrated whole in the society. Can mentioned in the video too? Oh, if you want to introduce yourself. A shout out to Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Bring up to my... Uh, I'm very fortunate to say that um, undergrads for the Abu Hiflab are an absolute cornerstone. Um, they can do experiments, they can take much, many more risks that can pay off very big and low cost. Whereas grad students, PhDs, professors, you know, they've got a lot more to lose if experiments don't work, but the undergrads can make real breakthroughs. We've made the first developmental tables in the world. We've done some really interesting analysis of slave rating behavior that undergrads have led. They're very much part of the lab and publications that come out from the lab.